I invite you to look with me to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. This is part of the section of 1 Corinthians that begins with chapter 12 and the nine spiritual gifts. To the church at Corinth. We know that these gifts were given because the church needed them. They were not given to make them feel more spiritual, but they were given because they were needed. I further am of the persuasion that there were nine people, nine people who received those gifts and no more. And that these nine individuals were men. Okay? With the 13th chapter, Paul begins by talking about love. There's a lot of people today that ought to read the first 10, uh, 10, uh, first 11 verses of 1 Corinthians 13 to learn what love is. Because certainly in our world today, it's turned into a selfish uh, thing that if I actually, I had someone tell me one time, if my husband really loved me, he would do this and he would do this and he would do that. That's not love. That's chains. That's prison. Okay? Love, something that is given without expectation of return. Paul explains that in the 13th chapter of what it is. Love is these things. I go down and I start with verse number 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Amen. Now, this verse marks a change in direction for the church at Corinth. Okay? And that change of direction comes because of the completion of of the Word of God. If you go back up uh, in this chapter to verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come, Brother Johnston, <laughs> the word that is a neuter pronoun. I've had people argue with me, that's Jesus. It's a neuter pronoun. That means it's neither male nor female. Jesus has never been referred to as a that in the Scripture. So it has to be a thing. When that which is perfect... What do we say about the word perfect? Complete. Complete. You know we're perfect in Christ, right? Alright. When that which is perfect is come then that which is in part shall be done away. So when the Scripture is completed, there's no more reason for the spiritual gifts to the church at Corinth. And they'll be done away. I imagine it was quite a shock to them to go to church one time and suddenly the gifts that they were had before. Discerning of spirits, which was able to tell if a man's saved or not. That'd be handy today. You know what I'm saying? They were no longer able to do these things. But they didn't need to. They had the completed Word. Everything we need to know about God, about being spiritual, about being anything as a Christian is found in the Word of God, isn't it? 
We've got all of the function we need. Okay? Plus we have the witness of three. And I'll talk about that directly. So this lady was trying to tell me that that's Jesus. When perfect has come, that's Jesus. Well, yes, He was sinless and perfect when He came. But what does it mean when He'll be done away? <laughs> okay, well, that's when the Spirit takes over and, you know, of course, He can explain such things. But the original language reads it, when perfection comes. So we know that that's the Scriptures. And we have the completed Scriptures, do we not? Alright? When it has come, the partial things, partial prophecy, partial knowledge will be done away. You know, we can't plead ignorance concerning our relationship with God, can we? Because we have His completed Word before us. But let's look at verse 13. And I'd like you to note, and now abideth. Okay? And now, meaning at this point, in fact, it, it reads from this point forward. Okay? The word abideth is a present tense active verb. Abideth, that means from this point forward we have this possession forward. Now there is no place in Scripture that reads that these things are going to stop. Okay? That suddenly we're going to be without something. Because all the Lord wants us to have, we have right in front of us. So from this point forward abideth... Uh, you remember in 1 John, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin... That's a present tense active verb. That means it cleansed you, you're saved, it'll cleanse you now, and it'll cleanse you tomorrow. The word abideth carries that same idea. He's with us now, he'll be with us later, and he'll always be with us. Okay? These things were always with us. In fact, these three things are probably the most important aspect of a Christian's life. To have these three things. Okay? So what is the first thing? First thing is faith. Where is the verse of Scripture? For without faith it is impossible to please Him. Impossible to please Him. Must first believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. For by grace are ye saved. Okay? Romans 5, faith, uh, uh, faith, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works with God, hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2 and verse 10. So we're saved by grace, not of ourselves. Are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. And then we become His work of art to be used of Him in His service. Where is the scripture? Faith without works, works is dead. James 2.17. Yes. Being alone. <laughs> 
in Romans chapter 4, isn't Abraham called the man of faith? When he was told to take his son to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice, he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Well, it only took him 25 years. I mean, what's the hurry, right? So faith, if we cannot grasp the principle of faith, we're going to be struggling with a lot of things. I believe, with all my heart, I believe this is the Lord's church. Doesn't belong to any of us. It's His. And He's promised to take care of her. As long as we do what we're supposed to be doing. Amen? Amen. Okay? So we have faith. Very important. No one can be saved without it. Hope is next. Hope is an expectation of things to come. Hope. Paul wrote in in the Thessalonian letter that you sorrow not even as others, what? Which have no hope. That's a sad place to be, isn't it? Do we understand how blessed we are? If we have to lay a loved one in the ground, our faith tells us that they're in heaven. But can you imagine a family not having that kind of hope, even as others which have no hope? It's the end. How are these poor atheists, they just think you go out of existence. You just cease to exist. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Paul clarifies in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21, if in this life only we have hope, what are we? Miserable folk. If this is all there is, I mean, we're just, goodness sake. So faith is vital, but also hope is vital. What keeps depression at bay? Faith and hope. Okay? Can we not agree? I think we can agree. The reason folk people turn to these drugs and alcohol and pills and things like that is they're trying to escape reality. Well, the problem is they have to come down from that stuff sooner or later and they're back where they started from. But they have no hope, do they? The only hope in this world is Jesus Christ and our faith in Him. That's all. That's all we got. And thank goodness we have it. These are pretty big gifts, aren't they? Okay? These are pretty big gifts. Hope. What's the next one? Charity. And this is agape, by the way. Agape, charity. Now, there is the kind of love that we would use if we say, well, I like Whoppers over Big Macs. It's phileo. Okay? There's the kind of love that takes from people and it doesn't give to people. And it's related to the erotica stuff. But you know, that stuff will take from take a person. They, it never adds to a person, does it? And then there is agape. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that word love is a high, holy kind of love, I call it. Okay? Now, when we as brethren, brothers and sisters in the Lord, and that's how we count ourselves, and we say, well, I love this brother, or I, I love this sister, 
It is that agape kind of love that we're talking about, isn't it? Should be. Okay? A respectful kind of love that causes us to treat one another as we should. You know, beloved, if God's people can't love one another, we're in bad shape. That's a terrible place to be for an individual and for a church. If hate finds a dwelling in a church, love is pushed out and we're, we're in trouble. I won't take time. Let's go to John chapter 13. Um, an identifier. Jesus gave his disciples an identifier, and I encourage you to mark these verses in your Bible, of John chapter 13, and we look at verse 34 and verse 35. A new commandment I write unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. This is John chapter 13, verse 34. Did I give the verse? I don't remember. Okay. Verse 34 and 35. As I have loved you, by this, by this love, shall all men know you are my disciples. What? If you have love one for another. Hmm? The right kind. It separates us from them. <laughs> okay? It separates us from them. Our motivation is not necessarily for people to please us, but our motivation is that we're supposed to love one another despite ourselves. John, Matthew chapter 7, did Jesus say something about what we're supposed to do about our enemies? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's easy, isn't it? Brother Ernie Lawson, missionary to Japan for like 30 years, told about the time he had this young lady who just married into this family. And of course, in Japan, you have generational homes. You have great-grandma, great-grandpa, and their children, and then your parents' children, and then when you have children, they all live in the same house. And the oldest lady is the matriarch of the house. She assigns the women of the house their particular duties to take care and keep the house clean. And this young lady spoke to him and said that her uh, mother-in-law, or she was of course speaking to the matriarch of the house, was very unkind to her. And he, she was asking what she's supposed to do. And he said, treat her like an enemy. Her eyes got real big. But that's what Jesus said, isn't it? Love your enemies. Do good to them that despitefully use you and persecute you. So, that was a challenge for her. And it is a challenge to love someone that doesn't love you, but yet, that is the distinct difference between God's people and the world. The world will turn to hate in a, just a little bit. We are supposed to operate under the umbrella of love and pray for that person and ask the Lord to change hearts. Romans chapter 12. If your enemy hunger, poisoning. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. Tell me you'll repent or else. <laughs> if you hear me hunger, feed him. If he needs drink. And if he needs fire to cook with, then you provide that fire. Some like to read that put coals of fire on his head that burns him up, makes him all discombobulated. But that's how sometimes people would let their, their fire pit go out and someone else would have to share fire in order for them to be able to cook food and have heat at night. All right? Yes? Get even. Yeah. 
Now, it's a little different than what we sometimes assume it is. All right, one more. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives. Now, exactly. What is the example? What's the standard? Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay, now that's, that's love, folks. That's love. But do we understand that where love lives, hate can never stay? The devil likes confusion. He loves confusion. He loves getting the Lord's people discombobulated, if you will. So they don't know which direction to go. But the Lord has answer for that. If we love one another as we should, stand true to what He says, and do what He says, then there's nothing the devil can do for us. Okay? So we have faith, hope, charity. There's so much more about charity. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4, forgiving one another, loving one another, all that. Just remember, who loved us despite who we were. Okay, you know, if the Lord did not come to us, we would have never gone to Him. Okay? Even when that sheep wanders off trying to get away and gets himself trapped and caught in a ditch, the shepherd still goes for him, goes after him and brings him back. That's love, isn't it? But you notice our verse, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13. These three, the witness of three, these three. There's always three, isn't there? In Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that word God there is Elohim, don't we? Three strong ones. Three. There's always three. 1 John 2, verse 17. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Yeah. Yeah, three with Satan too. Satan, the devil, and the wicked one. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Antichrist, there's going to be three. Yeah. The Antichrist, the false prophet, and another one. Beast. The beast. There's three. There are always the witness of three. There's three things in us, isn't there? So we have three levels of emotion, heart, soul, and mind. The witness of three. But Paul kind of nails it down hard when he said, these three, <laughs> not these five, not these nine, these three. Specifically, these three. That's pretty important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. These three. Now, were speaking in tongues included in that somewhere? I mentioned discerning of spirits. Um, so many, uh, they, they, like to be, they like to talk about being filled with the Spirit. Well, I tell you what, more people need to be filled with the Spirit, but the right kind of Spirit. Okay? But these three, and we have those three today. We have faith, obviously, to be saved and to please God. We have hope, our expectation that what God has said He will do. And we have love. And these three will send the devil to flight. He cannot handle it. Which is the greatest? Hmm? Which is the greatest? Yeah. 
Don't get ahead of me now. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. <laughs> I'm glad it's the greatest, don't you? The greatest of these is charity. And it is the greatest. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 3 in church work, isn't there, Brother Justin? Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse number 11. And he gave some prophets, evangelists, uh, and gave some apostles, some, evangel uh, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For what purpose? Mm hmm. important to understand pastor's obligation is to feed the word of God Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 right feed the church of God we purchase with his own blood all right verse 13 till we all come in unity of the of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man unto the measure or the stature or the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness wherein they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in may grow up unto him in all things which is the head even Christ, from whom, Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in... What are we, exactly are we doing here anyway? Are we not supposed to feed the Word of God? Learn something. Right? That you may not have known or, or heard before. Take that into you and next time you're in Scripture look at that and go, oh yeah, I remember that. So many things within this book that we'll never, never exhaust it. Okay? During Hurricane Andrew, this Christian lady went down to Louisiana area to work in the kitchen. They had a kitchen set up that could serve something like 15, 1600 meals at a time. Can you imagine laying out some sausage for that, huh? She was working there and humming and one of her co-workers kind of noticed what she was doing and went up and spoke to her she figured out pretty quick that he was not a believer in fact he was an atheist okay but he but her demeanor and her songs that she was singing just touched him. Folks, you know, our hymns are designed to touch the spirit of people. Have you ever heard a song? I'm not necessarily hymns, but have you ever heard a song that just touched you so deeply that you could say, Lord, thank you? Because that's just what I needed at that time. Well, they worked together for quite a while, for several weeks. And she was always in a pleasant mood, singing, working. I used to go to work. I had to be at work at 5 o'clock in the morning. And we had a worker, a lady, that would come in. Honestly, 
She'd walk back, good morning everybody. And I said, please, I have not had coffee or anything. I'm not ready for you right now. <laughs> but she exhibited the Spirit of Christ that it, that it touched him. And it was because of the singing. It was because of her joyousness that she exhibited. And it made a difference in that man's life. I don't know, I don't know if he ever came to know Christ as his Savior because of it, but it sure made a dent. Okay? It sure made a dent. Because these people were volunteers. They were not being paid to be there. They were volunteers. Dear ones, that's love. That's love. And, real quick, the greatest of these is charity. Is it not the greatest thing that this world has ever known? Made a difference in this in that man's life. He just, you know, because a lot of people don't know what love is. They don't know what love is. They don't. They don't know how to expect what love is. Okay. Now, real quick, Galatians chapter five: the fruit of the spirit is. What's first? Verse 21, love. What's joy anyway? Huh? Love, joy, peace. I mentioned a little bit ago about the power of three. Do you know these fruits of the Spirit are broken into three? I like it when Brother Johnson's up here. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> it is. They're broken into three. So let's see if we can break this down. Love, joy, peace. That is inside. What's the next three? I'm sorry. Real loud. Gentleness, goodness. Long suffering. Yeah. Long suffering. Cadence, our dog, will lay there and Henry will try to eat his paws, chew on his neck, or her neck, bouncing around, growling, yelling. She just lays there. <laughs> That's long suffering. That's long suffering. I'm sitting there telling, I tell Cadence, I say, Cadence, tell her to back off. Growl at her. Sit up and give her a good growl. Maybe that'll send, her, send him away. Long suffering. Okay? I, you know, sometimes watch nature shows and I try to be careful because you can imagine what's on nature shows. But you have this this uh, group of lions, this pride, and there's a bunch of babies, and there's dad laying out, stretching. Here come the babies, pouncing on him and biting at him, and all kind. He just turned. Uh, okay, long suffering. Now, love, joy, peace is on the inside. What's all, what about those next three? Yeah, they're, if the inside is right, love, joy, peace is on the inside, then we're going to demonstrate those next three. See that? All right, what's the last three? Faith, mm. mm -hmm. Something we can strive for or strive to. But you see how those are broken into three. Three aspects of the Spirit's work in our lives. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's wonderful, wonderful stuff. That's a nice picture. So, was the church at Corinth really losing anything? No, they were gaining. 
They were getting some stuff that would be that would help them to be what they should be for everyone's benefit. Now it's true that if they had someone from a different language come in and sit in their congregation, they wouldn't have that that uh, one to speak in his own language and then someone else to interpret. Okay? I'm sure that was a, ch it's a challenge for us, isn't it? Alright. So there's, there, it was going to be different, but they were actually gaining a deeper relationship with Christ through His Word and through the indwelling of the Spirit. Stand with me, please.